hello, hello. Oh, hello, mate. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. Oh, How are you doing? Such a, I'm all right. It's just such a surprise to see you here. <laughs> <laughs> How have you been? Yeah, all right, apart from punching my microphone. Um, yeah, honestly, great. No complaints, really. Everything's fine. What about you? <laughs> um, yeah, I am good. I'm a little bit... Um, uh, I don't really know what the what to, what the correct term is, but I've I've just come back from an ayahuasca retreat, which mm. was an incredibly intense couple of days, um, <laughs> and something I'm still processing. But um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, very very interesting trip. Mm. Um, for those who we- don't know, ayahuasca is like a an Amazon ancient Amazon medicine. Um, which uh, is quite good f- for kind of searching your soul. <laughs> Me and you couldn't have had more different weekends. <laughs> we just couldn't have done. I did lots of emails. <laughs> that was it. That would have been quite was... useful to do. Well, but, uh... I don't. I don't know. But was it? Was it? Was it good? Did you enjoy? It? Was it worth? Well, I guess you probably yeah. don't know quite yet. The, it's, I, I mean, I'm not. I'm not being, um, I'm not exaggerating when I said it. it was the most intense thing I've ever done and ever experienced. And, um, and you run a podcast. Exactly. With you. So, which is very intense. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Mr. Intenso. No, it's, um, yeah, just, uh, really like transformative. Um, I could blab on about it, but it's probably not going to be of that much interest to our listeners. So, um let's let's move on what 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 else has been going on it's been quite a busy week in the kind of or you know a couple of weeks in the photography world there's been some new releases new kind of kit coming out well and we've had ibc which is IBC. obviously a huge ibc massive um, kind bowel. of oh, contestion <laughs> yeah you're okay. completely correct no ibc i i'm fairly certain it's out in europe i think it's in amsterdam and it is a big trade show, but it's one of the big ones uh, for moving image stuff. So you have uh-huh. NAB, which is Las Vegas, and then you've got IBC, um, and then yes. you have a smaller one in the in London as well. Um, Am I right in thinking that Photo Kina is no more? Photo Kina, very sadly, I've got some very fond memories of doing talks at Photo Kina, and mm. it basically just died a death. And the trouble, mm. the trouble is, it's kind of like it's quite indicative of the industry that the biggest trade shows in the world. I mean, Photo Kina was pretty much the s- top five biggest. It might have even been the biggest to do your huge, great um, stills announcements. And it just basically it went from being so many of those. Did you ever go? No, I didn't. Was it held? It in, was, was it in Germany? Was it in Cologne? It was in. It, move it was in. Oh my god, where was it? Yeah, it might have been Cologne. Can't remember. It was. Um, um, but, oh, hang on, I'm gonna have to look that up. I'm fairly certain oh, my computer's not working. Um, I um, to give you an idea, I'll do a lot of that in SS episode. I'll turn to the left and I'll go. Yep, yeah, because what you guys can't hear on the recording is that I'm backing up an LTO tape, which has currently been backing up for almost four days. LTO is amazing, but quick at backing up or quick at retrieving data it is not um so i yeah i had a hard drive failure earlier in the week so it's been it's been a solid week and we're only on tuesday Hmm. so that's going very well um but no i i think it was in frankfurt uh photo could uh but it was uh at one of these kern messer i think was the was the place it was at anyway i i went a few times and did various talks for various companies and always had a great time and mm. everyone there was super friendly and but it was you've been to the photography show up in Birmingham as yes. a lot of our listeners have photo kina made that look like a matchbox yeah it was photo kina was the biggest trade show i've ever been to mm. and it was over it felt like it was over seven or eight of those halls and yeah. it just every time you turned, there was an escalator that would take you up into a different hall full of four hundred companies, and it was wow. yeah, it, it was amazing. So it was really sad to see that it stopped. Well, but it was they partly used COVID, wasn't it? That... COVID completely killed it. Um, mm. And then they tried 
to do what the photography show tried to do, which is why there is no photography show this year or last year. I can't remember. They're basically moving the photography show back from September to March. Hmm. Um, and then Photokina tried to, I think, to move the dates as well. And then mm. that didn't work because everyone liked how it was. You know, all these things worked. Photokina mm. was biennial. Um, mm. Or biennial, biannual. It was biennial. every two years. Right. right. Not entirely sure when that is. <laughs> we'll go with, it was go, every two years. It was every two years. And, yeah. um, and it was amazing because everyone would put real effort into it. But this just, it just sadly isn't a thing. And the cost of these, running these events especially yeah. ones of that size, especially when you've got a lot of companies now. Let's talk about Fuji. But Fuji are very good at drumming up their own hype around a launch. They're mm. very good at doing their own product launches. And actually, do you need to really launch a camera at an event? Or do you, yeah. do you run out with a load of influencers and a load of paid content over various uh, yeah. blogs and loads of review stuff? It's probably cheaper to do yeah. All of that. Then so I, 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 I got invited to the um, House of Photography of Fuji, which is Fujifilm's um, flagship kind of store in Covent Garden, London, mm. for their launch um, last week or the week before of the GFX 100S Mark II. And mm-hmm. they were live streaming the actual launch, which was taking place in Stockholm in Sweden. There's a massive photography museum in Stockholm, which if um, you ever get a chance to visit is is really impressive. It's right on the waterfront. Um, And they were doing their launch from there and it was streaming across to their other stores worldwide, I think. Interesting. That's the way that they did it. And the the team from Japan had obviously gone out to Stockholm um, and they were working with you know local swedish photographers there was a street photographer they were working with and a portrait photographer and what have you and they were all kind of talking through the camera Mm -hmm. um, that they'd obviously been shooting with for a couple of weeks if not months secretly um so that was interesting to see and then and then they revealed that they actually had them in there in the store in london which was quite cool because obviously up until that point no one had seen one in the flesh um so yeah i got to have hands on with that camera and it it looks really impressive it's um you know it's they've got some really interesting ergonomic choices they've made the the actual top of the camera whereas previously on most cameras you kind of have a flat top with your um you know with your lcd screen Mm -hmm. they've actually tilted it back so it's more ergonomically kind of designed so you can kind of glance down and actually see it quicker and easier Um, just like little touches like that they've changed they've they've gone back to having a removable um evf so you can use the old articulated evf which i really liked which came out on their Mm -hmm. first um you know large format camera which means you can actually look down into it because it's can i just can i just pull can i pull you up and just say it's not large format well large format large format format. i was was trying not to say medium format because it's not medium format larger larger format yeah than me yeah because it's it's format it's medium format light Right, because yeah. it's obviously not the traditional full size, but it is what one point four times bigger than thirty five mil, something like that. So yeah, it is quite a bit bigger than thirty five. One hundred and two megapixels. The output. I know that's not the same, but that's the output from the the new um, sensor they're using. Which that's is the same just as not, the last one. That's just not enough for Instagram. <laughs> that's too much. It's too little. I need at least 800 megapixels to post my stuff on Instagram. Well, this is the one thing that kind of holds me back. And I'm interested to see the file sizes on those, um, you know, when you've got them compressed raw. It would be interesting mm-hmm. to see because for me, with a lot of my jobs, it would it would be too much. It would be too big. You know, if I was shooting, if you're shooting portraits or something and you've got less or kind of more focus but when you're doing like uh, a project or a, or a feature story you're going to end up with you know thousands of images and if they are that file size then that's going to be i don't know um a bit i should be running out of space left right and center well i owned that gfx 100 the mark one the gray one mm. fuji yeah, yeah yeah why did you make it gray worst thing ever i got rid of it pretty much because of the color it was horrible but let's have a look. I, I like the grey. Greg. <laughs> I do. Really? Do you actually? Yeah. I don't oh, like no. it. 
But are you one of these guys who'd have like one of those Pentax special editions, like pink and yellow kind of cameras? Do I look like a kind of guy that'd have a pink and yellow camera? Every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying. I'm just trying to find. Uh, actually, yeah, I, sh- I got this one, so I can tell you that the. Oh no, I didn't keep the roars from that because it was so big. Mm. Um, let me have a look. This is I. I shoot quite a lot, so it's. Where did we go? Personal soul. Here we go. I shot this, and again, I've kept. I've not kept the the raw files. Here we go. Ready. Two hundred and ten megabytes per raw file. Hmm. So to give you an idea, nine hundred and sixty-one images shot on a project that ended up being two hundred and two point two gig. Yeah, not insubstantial. Not insubstantial. And the, and this is, interestingly, let's talk about this, because I had a conversation with someone uh, earlier in the week. Obviously, you know I run Mainframed. Um, mm. and Mainframed is an AI and tech consultancy, mainframe.com. Greg, tell me if I'm not allowed to pu- plug it, but I can cut this out. <laughs> <laughs> but the, we, were doing, we were doing a, um, a kind of a system recommendation. And I was saying to them, actually, look, the R6 Mark II, they're coming up from a 5D Mark IV, R6 Mark II is the logical step. And they were like, well, what about the R5? And I was like, do you need the resolution? Because actually, if you really don't need the resolution and are thinking maybe I might need it once or twice a year, well, use uh, Photoshop's super resolution on those files that you use once a year, rather than buying an R5 and having huge, great files. Because what people don't tend to, uh, what people I think understand a bit more about now is you have these masses of files. And then if you're starting to shoot video as well, your storage, it's not just the cost of buying the camera. It's the cost of then suddenly having to buy all this extra storage and then making sure your computer can handle, especially all the video aspects of it. You know, yeah, we're very lucky process, now. Processing is, yeah, exactly. All the power that is needed for that as well. And it's very intense. It's very intense. So um, it's it's always good to kind of figure out. So is so is that possibly what's holding you back from, because I know you're a Fuji guy, right? Really? You own yeah. the, the Canon stuff, but really, I, I know, you're deep down, you're Fuji through and through. But the... Um, you cut me and I bleed Fuji. <laughs> <laughs> but the but the, you know that i saw this camera and i was just like oh i wonder if greg's interested in that because it kind of looks i i look I I very tempted it. they have they have a new lens for it as well which just looks absolutely gorgeous and they've also brought out a range of not that i use them that often but they've brought out some of their own tilt shift lenses so i can oh, see cool. yeah i can see where the market will be for that camera you know like if mm-hmm. you're doing high-end interiors architecture or kind of hotel interiors or something like that then you know those lenses and that body would be amazing because they're going to give you such you know gorgeous files Mm -hmm. um and yeah and for portrait work i i still think that it might be a camera that i get and use for certain assignments and then use the xf system the smaller sensor system for the kind of more travel stories or what have you but then mm-hmm. I'm back into the current situation that I have, which is having two different camera systems. I, really, you know, I just want to have one. Yes, but look at it from a post-production point of view. If you're using Fujis and Canons, currently that's not unified in any way. But if you're using yeah. Fuji and Fuji, the color science will be the same across yeah. Yeah, the yeah, line, yeah. right? So logically, the, I'm sure the colors will be different because it's a different sensor, but they'll be closer to what you're you be better and easier to mix and match between the xt and the the gfx than yeah. it would be the xt and the r5 stuff yeah um it's the ergonomics as well though obviously like with any time you switch between cameras you kind of your muscle memory is this you know is kind of going your fingers are going into a certain your fingers and your thumbs are going to a certain button and as mm-hmm. soon as you change camera system it's like it's no longer there um so that that's not you know and again that's already current situation between switching between the fujis and the canons um at least switching between the fuji and a fuji the menu systems are going to be the same yeah so yeah well, definitely def- definitely is there as a temptation for me um you know i'm just i'm just waiting for the kind of the sign the sign yeah fair <laughs> enough fair itself. enough 
<laughs> I think what's that's interesting though that you talk about the ergonomics because people now, you know, as photographers, we get asked by relatives or people at get-togethers or the, you know, oh, I'm thinking about buying a camera. I'm like, oh yeah, great, cool. Can't wait to have this conversation <laughs> again. Um, but you know, you you say they're like, oh, what would you recommend? And I just go, honestly, they're pretty much you give all them the a same. Card for mainframe, don't you? And say, oh, I, I do, can tell you, I but do, it's going to cost I do you. Now. <laughs> I say, well, here's a ten percent off code. <laughs> Um, but I, I just go, right, go to PC World, London Camera Exchange, whatever is your nearest yeah. place you can get hands on with them and feel them. Yeah. Right. Like you'll find that maybe a Sony won't feel right compared to the Canon or the Fuji. Yeah. 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 And things like that. And I feel and that matters that massively to me. And I, I was saying this to the guys at, at Fuji the other week, you know, like the ergonomics are so important. Um, you know, having that back focus button on the XH2s. Is mm-hmm. what kind of made me move from the XT series to the XH series on the right. Fujis, but just because I use back button focus and I need to have a big fat button for my thumb to find easily. You know, it has to. Um, that's it. It has to. Everything that we have has to be easy. And I've got to say that is one of the biggest things, one of the biggest advantages for me about all these mirrorless cameras is being able to map all the buttons to whatever feature. Yeah, and, and this, the, actually, the one of the things with the GFX, which is really cool, is underneath the shutter button they now have three little programmable buttons so at the front where your sh- trigger finger is they have these three buttons at the front that you can program oh, to anything because that's actually is useless like, that's useless space isn't it that's never yeah. ever used for anything that's really neat and, and it's literally like a little jump for your finger you know and you can mm. so i i saw actually the new iphone has now got this so the iphone 15 has now got a little action button that you can program well, greg I have it. <laughs> I have do. it here. So I have the iPhone 15 Pro with to prove. I love that they call it a Pro. Is there a non-Pro version? There is a non-Pro version. Yeah, this is a, what, a completely what's the non-Pro. What, what did this... you become a Pro in phones? I get access to ProRes, <laughs> and this now shoots log. This now shoots log ProRes. Jesus, up to 4K 60. Like okay. that's cool, right? And then. I can plug, so you know I have, I have a camera. Obviously, that's not really a humble brag. Oh, is it, is it USB-C now? It's USB-C, and that, yeah, honestly, so you can, uh, that, no more faffing around using their stupid app, Canon. I love you, don't get me wrong. I am, like, so into Canon, everything about what I use. But your app and Wi-Fi, I understand that there's limitations because of how it works, but, like, it's just so slow and clunky. But now, I literally plug the camera straight into my phone, open up Lightroom on my mobile, click, and then it just shows up in as attached device, and I can very quickly just go, yep, yeah, that, 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 pull through. It's instant. And that, yeah. for me, is going to completely change Light so room, many things. Tom. Lightroom? Yeah, on the mobile. On the Capture, mobile. Though. Capture oh, on yeah, the mobile. <laughs> hmm. So I have for I have I have just the problem the problem is right is just they're 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 completely different beasts you know we've got yeah. obviously Raphael coming on the show next week no I think it's I don't know we haven't figured it out or have anyway, we ruined the surprise he's coming anyway. up coming up he's coming he's coming up but but they're very different beasts I I if I was going to shoot something to my phone tethers yeah yeah I, yeah. I'd be the using thing. the capture. You can now, you can now, in theory, you could shoot tethered to your iPhone, which is insane, and yeah. edit the raw files on your phone with uh, the latest updates from Capture One. Um, it's... Speaking well, of which, th- but when I, I, I actually... go on, go on. Sorry, no, no. I was just going to say when when we had Raphael on. Now, full disclosure, we interviewed Raphael what last week, week before, and I was just like, I'm never going to use my phone to do this. Blah blah blah. I shot to my phone the other day. There we like, go. It's, honestly, I, I it didn't think... I, you didn't think you needed. Well, yeah, but also just for, on a quick personal thing where I didn't need to have the, um, the, the laptop out, my mm. Bron trigger has a little hot shoe on top of it. So I have a little phone holder that goes in the hot shoe a short USB cable comes out and it's much nicer to have the image, the histogram, all the data on a bigger screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And I was just like, yeah. okay, well, now I, now I sort of understand when I have to be like really compact with everything. Yeah. Well, originally it was kind of designed for the iPad, wasn't it? Which, I, again, I can totally see like why you would, for certain shoots, it would be great to be able to, to shoot straight through to the iPad Pro. Well, I do um, that a lot. Hmm. I do that a lot now. I've not done it yet, but the one feature I used, which again, because we pre-recorded our chat with Raphael at the time, I hadn't used. So Mm. I can get your head around this. But in the future, when you listen to that episode, (laughs) I won't have used this feature, which I have now used on a previous episode. Anyway, um, which was the live feature. um, Ah, yeah. To be able to publish images from a session in order for the client to then be able to go through and pick their selects. Mm-hmm. do their star ratings and then it updates the session itself mm-hmm. so rather than having a list of file names you then have to go and find you just go back into your capture one session and they're all their selects are there which was a bit of a game changer can i quickly say you that works when clients are on it you know what i mm. mean if if clients come back to a shoot a couple of months later the session's out of date because the, the sessions will stay online, I think it is, for either a month or two months. But you don't have to make it live, so you can just make it live when they're ready to do their selects, if you see what I mean. I know what of you're course. saying. I know what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. It lasts I for d- a certain amount of time online. But if, but I, d- if I, I do the same thing. Through and the client needs it quickly, then it's going to work because mm-hmm. they're going to go through and make their selects and then it will just update my session. 100%. I, I, but I do the same thing as well. When, I'm, when I do a personal shoot and I am going, oh, it's been a long day. I want to go through the images, but I don't want to sit in my office and I want to go and watch something mindless on the telly, try and decompress. I set it to go live and then I send myself the note in, well, I'll send myself a, the link in an email or reminders or whatever. I open that on the iPad and then I'm able to go through on the iPad and make my selects for my personal mm. project in front of the telly. Come back the following morning, boom, selects already made. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's amazing. There's, li- there's little features now that I questioned at the beginning, and now I'm starting to just, I basically now I've just started to implement everything they try to really mm. try and see how it benefits. And there's little things like that that have just been brilliant. Yeah. And the iPad um, thing, for example, quickly, the I shot a personal project at uh, a jousting, a medieval joust uh, thing a couple of weeks ago. And uh, one of the conditions of me shooting there was that they had the images released in case the guys at the joust wanted to use them. And I was like, mm. yeah, that's that's fine. You know, that, that's, you know, it's a, it's a really fun festival. Um, but then being able to flick between shooting to an iPad and showing the subjects their portraits straight away on the iPad to them being like, hey, what do you think? And they're like, these are really beautiful. And I'm like, right, here's the release you need to sign on the same iPad. Yeah. That's, that was super cool. And I was like, that's actually, that makes me look super, like, super slick as well. Yeah, yeah, rare. yeah, that's really cool. <laughs> do you use a particular app for that release? Yes. I, they're all rubbish. Right. They're all rubbish. They're all out of date. They all look like they were done for iOS 1 um, before it was called iOS. Um, And so, um, yeah, but the one I found that is is the most customizable and the simplest is Easy Release. Okay, yeah. And that seems to be one of the ones that's still regularly updated. If you guys are listening, it needs a massive overhaul as far as the UI goes because Mm -hmm. it's looking slightly medieval. But other than that, the functionality, so that, the functionality, that for that particular. yeah, exactly, exactly. They were like, "Wow, you've bought you a give period them a quill to sign you've it." Bought, with, yeah, well. they've bought, you've bought a period release app. Um, they, but the, they just stamped your iPad with wax and their seal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you were like, "Please don't." <laughs> but I've, but I, but I've bought, I've bought something else as well. I've bought mm-hmm. an iPad What's Air. That? So, oh. so my friend James, how many iPads talented. do you now own? Six. To be fair, I no. thought it was more than that. So five, I think. Okay, I've got loads of the iPad Pros and then uh, a regular iPad and then this iPad Air. But the iPad Air is um, it's cool because I now am taking that whenever I'm tethering. In addition to the iPad Pro or the not not the iPad Pro, but if I if I'm shooting to the laptop, I bring the iPad in as well. So my friend James was uh, was showing me some neat tricks with notes. And so I'm now, when people are like, what are we shooting? 
I will export a couple of low res, ping them into a note on the laptop, which then syncs to the note on the, the iPad. And so I'm able not to bring people over to the laptop and stuff like that, but I'm able to just very quickly on the iPad, just be like, yeah, here's the brief. This is what we're doing. Here are the images. And then mm. I have a, I have a shoot note note for every shoot now. And it's full of the PDF brief and things like that. And it's just really, it's really useful really good I've way of not, doing it i mean the notes application is really powerful isn't it on the but I've, I've always used other things but um i do need to sit down and actually explore just using apple notes yeah i mean it, the, here's the thing i you know have historically made my life slightly more difficult by using all these extra things and creating extra workflows and things like that actually there is something to be said for going back stripping it all out and using just the native apps because actually some of them now are really powerful like notes has got all sorts of tagging features and then you can link notes within notes and Mm. the galleries that you can put in it's really neat and then reminders Mm. i was using good task to do my to-do list whereas actually i've deleted that now and just use reminders because the reminders app turns out pretty good now Yeah. yeah 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 Yeah, I, I only use that for shopping lists. Oh yeah, um, but oh, I yeah. do need. I do. I should. I should uh, start using it more. Well, but, have um, you seen the new feature about shopping lists? In no, the new, in the new version of iOS, you can change it to uh, be a. Can, you, can we call it iOS? Is that not what it's? Well, yeah. Is it iOS? Yeah. Well, why, why do I call it iOS? I sound like that sounds lady like a off the telly. God, it does doesn't it? <laughs> so, welcome to iOS. But the um, the yeah the iOS shopping list app you can now change it to a shopping list so if you put in eggs milk butter flour it can then put that into the right areas of the supermarket so dairy baking i see yeah so Ah. and bakery and stuff like that so you know when tell you like and third left on aisle three how do you know the integrations (laughs) the integrations these days are crazy (laughs) wow but one thing i got this week i was going to say talking about shopping lists um uh, Fun. so i have um harry to thank you for this so harry for listening um i did end up getting it harry was assisting me on a shoot a few weeks back and kind of mentioned these i have to say i haven't used it yet it only came the other day and i've been away so i haven't had a chance to use it but it's uh on camera flash uh this one is designed to work with fuji ttl but what's neat about it um i mean it's a fairly basic flash but then there aren't that particularly good flashes for the fujis this has a little tilt up feature which isn't a game changer by any means but it has an led um modeling light um, Mm -hmm. which probably is not going to be great but maybe better than nothing but what is quite cool is at the back you can press this button and release this section which then becomes a transmitter for the flash so you can use the flash in on off-camera capacity and that obviously just stays in your hot shoe. Um, so obviously, for anyone who's listening on to, listening to the podcast rather than watching it, it's the very, very bottom, effectively the hot shoe, yeah. and a little bit above it just pops out. Yeah, just a little and square. And you can then pops detach out the, bottom the whole of the flash unit. And then the the flash unit is probably the size of a packet of cigarettes. Mm-hmm. And it's the Flash Q M20 um, from Light Picks Labs, which is uh, I imagine a Chinese firm. Um, you know, but it's pretty clever it just takes aa batteries but you can put rechargeable aas in and then recharge them in the flash if you so desire um so yeah i'm gonna give that a go and see what it's like because i do like having uh just a little on-camera flash occasionally for the for the fujis mm. um you know just just for that kind of certain look that you occasionally want um mm-hmm. and the fact i'm it's not so gonna small. i'm not gonna lie i would have absolutely killed for that in my music photography days like mm. full on, like absolutely would have killed for that because I was doing, I was doing that, but with all the the Canon coiled TTL cables, yeah, 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 and all that kind of well, stuff. Well, I still do that with my with my um, my Leica when I you don't have to use you have to use Nikon TTL cables, I think, for the mm-hmm. for the Leica rangefinders. But um, I use, still use one of them with an off camera flash occasionally, and it's uh, it is a pain being restricted by that coil. Um, so I'm excited to see how well this thing works. But I will get back to you. I will let you know. Do a little um, 
we can do it i'll do a little review on one of our um fireside chat pods in the future so perfect this- yeah because we, we we're, we're trying to make these a bit more up to date and a bit more relevant so talking about this i did a shoot in spain about two months ago <laughs> Um, no, we, we, I don't know if anyone follows me on Instagram. If you do, I can only apologise. But we went to, um, we had to get to Madrid to do this to do this job. And uh, shout out to James and Tom for obviously making it happen. But we we were stuck in all that air traffic control nonsense at Heathrow. So we got to Heathrow for the British Airways, who were the least helpful people on the planet when we got there, to then um, be told that our only option really was to drive to Madrid from Heathrow which is a 17-hour drive. So we, we basically just went, yeah, all right. <laughs> so we started the drive, and we basically then realized that maybe we'd bitten off more than we could chew. But we went, we drove to Paris and then flew from Paris the following morning, got there an hour before we were due to arrive. Had we got, uh, well, we due, we, yeah, we arrived an hour due before we be were due there, to yeah. arrive. Yeah, yeah, so we did all right. But James had was being lent this little camera now I have hmm. to I have to put this necklace on, so I'm going to put I'm going to put a necklace on, which is not quite what I think anyone thought was going to start. So I'll move this I'll move this microphone over. The camera is this. Let me see if I can get this to focus. There we go. An Insta360 Go Three. There are so many problems with it, but it has got this very cool feature. That is the camera. That's how cool. cool is that so so the camera pops out um and the, what size the, would you say that is for listeners the whole <laughs> unit is probably the size of a matchbox so it's just over two I love inches that, I love the fact i go with things like it's the size of a cig- <laughs> cigarette packet it's the size of the matchbox and you're like i'm just going to measure it and tell you what let size me, it is <laughs> let me get my cal- let me get my calipers out so it's just over two inches tall and just under an inch wide mm-hmm. and it's got magnets on the back so right. check this out. Ready? Oh, I so see. For any, That's what the for necklace who's... is for. Right. Wow. How that good is, is cool. that? And then quickly pull it off, put it on a stand. Come back for personal eye view. And then it needs to be charged. It's back in the thing. Then pull it out. Then I have a little clamp. I have a clamp here that I have uh, mounted to a light stand. Wow. And so I had that mounted inside a drag car at the weekend. And I was able to just control the thing remotely, turn it all on, get this kind of just, I only wanted a very, very split second, because I will say the video is 8-bit and not the best quality. But for getting quick content, Mm. it's great. And it all records on this. So actually, this can just be in a bag. It doesn't matter. What's the storage on there? 64 gig. Okay. And how how long is the battery life? Uh, about forty minutes, okay, which is which is fine. Uh, it's yeah, about, you, it's as you about... said, you just want it to give you that kind of unique perspective on something, and you can just yeah, hundred percent. You do, I, it's it's not like a GoPro. It's kind of mm. it's a it's a it's a similar shape, I guess, when it's all like this to a GoPro, but it's a very different thing. I will say, Insta three hundred and sixty. If you are listening, let me plug it in via USB C and transfer all the video straight off. Currently, you have to select it all onto your phone and then get it off your phone onto the computer, which is, Mm. I would say, the most frustrating thing I've possibly ever had in a workflow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it is very cool to just be able to, you know, plonk this on a lighting stand and then pull it off the lighting stand, pop it on your top. Yeah. And then, yeah, I'm really enjoying it. I haven't used anything from it yet. But I, I, it's it's a it's a funny thing to funny thing to use, and it's also got this flow state thing. So when the camera is like that and then rotates, the orientation of the video stays the same. Oh wow! So yeah, so the horizon stays level, which I know GoPros have had for a while. But it's um, yeah, I thought it was a it's a cool little thing. It was about four hundred and forty pounds. It's gonna be interesting to see what GoPro released to try and claw back their corner of the market. Honestly, I think they're they're aiming at such different corners of the market. I don't think GoPro are going to be worried. This is no, very but much like the action camera, the action camera thing of being able to put your camera anywhere. Mm. Like, I still feel like GoPro could help. You know, it 
obviously you can mount them on a whole array of brackets and you can get third party brackets for GoPros, but the idea of just being able to magnetize it onto something chunk oh, right there that it is. Has you know, been, that's, that's amazing that is a complete game changer you know it is yeah. it is so quick to just literally just pull it off that stand put it on and chop put it on the camera yeah. you know you're able to get you know you're talking about gopros you have the clip and you unclip it and then you kind of put it over there and by that point yeah. you could have shot two or three things with this this thing and it's yeah, yeah it's quite the footage is not the best quality but actually mm. if it's just going on instagram stories does it really matter? Because I think that's a that's yeah. a thing that I'm really just letting go of is for years and years and years, I've held off posting things on social media because the quality wasn't quite right or it wasn't quite the right vibe. Well, actually, yeah. that doesn't matter. Yeah. It yeah. doesn't matter. So I'm not grading anything anymore. I'm just putting iPhone footage straight up, you know, yeah. just having a nice time doing it. Although now I will also say the new iPhone I went for the one terabyte version. Oof. Yeah. Yeah. Proper. But I was so, I literally absolutely killing me trying to get um, any free storage on my phone all the time because it's just full of pictures that I do want to do want to keep. And then I, I kind had of... a massive cull on mine and, and deleted everything going back to 2012 off my phone. Wow. Lots of pictures, apart from the things that I'd saved and put into uh, folders. So there's a trick with it where you have to hide the images and then go into your main camera um, folder and delete everything that's not that's in hidden. there. Yeah, everything's not hidden. And then once you've deleted it, you can go back and unhide and they will go back into their folders. So all your favorites and stuff you can kind of keep. Clever. But it was it was quite traumatic because there are times when you kind of like, oh, when did that happen? And you just you use your timeline on your phone as like a memory, don't you? You go mm-hmm. back and you be like, oh yeah, it was somewhere around there, and it might be the type of picture that you're not going to have thought of saving. So that has been hard, but uh, it was also it was like quite rewarding just to you know just lose just let all that stuff go. I mean, it's no, all of course. obviously backed up in multiple places, um, but yeah, it's just no it's longer good on to, my phone. Good to free up the space. Do you know what? When I was freeing mm. up the space the other day, do you know what I found? What's I found that? a picture of me with S Club Seven. Now, when you were in S Club Seven, no, no, this is this not is many classic. people know this about Tom, but he was actually the sixth member uh, of. The <laughs> I don't know how it many was, members there were. It was there, the seven? Was there was seven. There were seven. <laughs> there were seven. It, it will really shock well, you clue to in learn. There somewhere. There were... <laughs> Do you know what though? So the um, the yeah. So when I, I was a stroppy teenager, hard to believe. I know, but I was a stroppy teenager, and I had to go and get passport pictures done. And I had cycled down the hill with my money to go to the the passport. Uh, picture booth that was in local Sainsbury's and I had sat down in the booth. Making it sound like this is in the 1950s, but carry on. This was, this was in the <laughs> 1990s for sure. And I, and I had gone down, might have been early 2000s, but I was very stroppy and I had sat down in the chair and I had pushed the wrong button. And so... Oh, S Club 7 came out. What's yeah, it? because this was, this, was the, <laughs> this was the time of S Club 7 and I had accidentally pushed the wrong button because the machine, you know, they used to do that thing where they'd freeze and then you'd have to hit all the buttons and then you'd right, just, yeah. whatever came out, came out. What, mm. Whatever came out was a picture of me looking deadpan and like serious because obviously it's a passport picture, but then put in behind the rest of S Club 7. <laughs> so I'll see if I can dig it out for the show notes, but it oh, is amazing. an absolute classic. So That is brilliant. Yeah, <laughs> save save that to my favourites. <laughs> yeah, I think I've got a photo from when I was on a job in Japan with all our team because in Japan it's quite big to have um, these. You get these kind of photo booths, which are anime photo booths, and We've, so I've you done manipulate one. the images and you end up with like your anime eyes and everything. Mm-hmm. It's and lots of kind of kitties everywhere. It's quite creepy. Perfect. Yeah, I think we need to <laughs> dig that one out for the show notes as well. <laughs> Like these these pictures could actually just be the uh, the Instagram posts. We're sorted. Do you want to do you want to know do you want to know a good picture of me in Japan? Yeah, I'm stood up, but it looks like everyone else has knelt down. <laughs> and we were just we were because obviously I'm six foot six, kind of six foot five and a half. But don't tell anyone. And um and Very, yeah, depending we on whether get... or not you're wearing your platforms. Exactly, exactly. Sometimes it can be seven foot. <laughs> 
Um, but the yeah, there's this classic shop of me in a chip shop, like a potato chip shop, like a crisp shop, and um, yeah, everyone else looks like they are on their on their knees, and I am st- just stood. <laughs> it's it's a classic. Turns out they are all actually stood up. It's a good time. So quickly, I wanted mm-hmm. to start a new regular feature about bits of gear we cannot live without trying to think of like things that would be useful for the listeners and so i was going to suggest bongo ties but i'm gonna have to leave that for another week because ironically i they're in my cases and they're all stacked up and i couldn't get them out in time so i'd like to talk about kniffs (laughs) happy to talk about kniffies yeah yeah yeah. so and I think everyone listening will know this noise. Right? Hear it again? That is a Leatherman being opened. <laughs> Maybe with a bit of uh, extra foley. Um, but these Leathermans and other brands are available. You've got Gerber, you've got Victorinox and stuff like that. They have helped me out. I can't even begin to tell you how many times. And I'm sure we're preaching to the choir but if you don't have like a good multi tool in your bag, don't buy the really expensive ones because they go missing. Buy uh, like a relatively cheap, like I would say forty quid kind of one. This was a great tip given to me by someone on a film set ages ago. They were like, don't buy the actual Leathermans uh, because they will get pinched on on various sets, especially when you're working, you know, with hundreds of people. But if you buy the um, the kind of the cheaper ones. By the time they've got got pinched, they're blunt anyway, so it doesn't matter. Mine's, bit, mine's engraved with my name, so it'd be a bit of a bastard to take that. So my originally, my Leatherman was originally engraved with my name, and then I broke the blade, and Leatherman's replacement um, service was so good, they just sent me a brand new... Do we Hang on, do we have the same one? Do you have a black so, oxide surge? Uh, no, mine's a Wave, which is slightly smaller than the Surge, I think. Is it Black Oxide, though? Yeah. Sick. The the Black Oxide, guys, is the one to have. Because okay, it's... Okay, if we, if we, I know you, you've got something to, to introduce that's not your Leatherman, right? But I before do, we I move do. off Leathermans... Sure. This this is... I'm going to see if the camera will focus on that. Oh, is, is that the watch strap? No, the bra- it's the, not going to focus, bracelet. is it? have to do that. Right, so this is the bit kit. Ah. that you can get which is normally two bits but the, the other day i found someone selling this bit online which actually connects the two bits together oh that's cool so you kind of have it hinged i don't know if you see that but that then keeps everything nice and neat in one package hide your eyes yeah <laughs> yeah yeah that's 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 really cool but i've got a tip for Stop people it. So <laughs> nice. Well, they do last, and they will get replaced. Yeah. Um, my tip is: I have I've got a collection of lovely, beautiful, hand-built knives. Thanks to the people I've done personal projects with, or beautiful things that I've been given as gifts. Like uh, I've got some Nawaki folding Japanese knives and stuff like that. And I've noticed that in the office, they just get covered in gunk when you're opening parcels. They get open like covered in the residue and stuff like that. And I was ruining mm. all these beautiful knives. And I was just like, well, hang on, there's got to be a better option. So I have bought one of these. So I have bought uh-huh. a Bosch, and it is a folding Set box. Set Bosch. Properly. There we go. How was that? How was that for you? Was that all right? So it's a yeah. it's a, a Bosch folding box cutter knife with obviously detachable uh, razor blades, and that for me turns out is an excellent tip because now, obviously, when the blades get knackered. You pull them out and they're pennies to replace and they can be recycled as opposed to lobbing. My big thing now is trying to be as sustainable as possible. That knife will outlast me and and those razor blades are the most commonly available type of decorating blade ever. I have to ask, how many packages were you opening a day to get to blunt a Japanese well, knife? Interesting, interesting you say that. So it's actually me sending gear out. Let me see if I can... I, I think I think what, what we're kind of avoiding is the elephant in the room is probably <laughs> your purchasing <laughs> rather than... 
if I'm bluntening 300 <laughs> knives a year, maybe you are right. Maybe I am. Maybe I'm doing. No, honestly, right, Greg. So it's not the um, it's not the parcels that are being opened that's the problem. I because I'm trying to be sustainable in pretty much oh, yes. everything I do. I now use a recyclable tape. Yeah, you put me onto this. I've got that's, some of this now. And it's, but it's really, you know how normally you get the recycled stuff and it's just rubbish. Well, this stuff, yeah. as you know, is has got the most aggressive gum in the yeah. world. Like it's, am, fibers, it's amazing. It? Yeah, and it's got, yeah, it's reinforced. So whenever you're packaging anything up, you also, you also need to use less because it's so strong. You can mm. get away with using really minimal amounts of tape. But, and here's the tip with the knife: the gunk in it is so strong that it means that you absolutely have to. Uh, basically do the dis- not disposable blade trick but basically it wrecks any knives uh unless you're using kevlar scissors shout out to william whiteley uh for that tip but the um yeah the ni- the knife thing is um yeah it's a good tip but that tape is excellent as well mm. you could probably use rubbing alcohol couldn't you to clean the blades uh yeah that would have been cheaper yeah <laughs> <laughs> anyway no those bosch knives are, are good we'll we'll try and link to all the stuff we've mentioned so if you're listening back it'll be in the show notes and if you're watching it'll be in the comments below on youtube mm-hmm. um but i think do you think do you think that's everything i know that we um we've got we've got a couple of belters coming up in the pipeline for the show um we've also we're we're looking to get some suggestions from the audience so if you guys want to hear a particular subject or you've got somebody in mind that you'd like to hear from or a yeah some aspect of the industry that you think we haven't quite covered and you'd like us to explore then do let us know so that we can start to kind of reach out to people that we think would make good guests absolutely Um, obviously this show is 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 for you guys out there and um you know we we have great interactions with some of our listeners kind of making suggestions and we really appreciate it so please feel free to reach out and get in touch no absolutely and and obviously if you uh if you feel like the show has been useful at all it would be really helpful for us if you could join our uh patreon scheme uh we we run a scheme where we have a scheme makes it sound like a ponzi doesn't it so it's not (laughs) there's nothing dodgy about it at all <laughs> but it's we keep, uh, it's keeping Tom in Bosch knives. Keep, yeah, exactly, exactly. Where do you think all the knives come from? Um, <laughs> but yeah, so we we have a Patreon where people can subscribe. It's three ninety nine a month, um, and hopefully you feel like it's it's worth it. Shout out to obviously everyone who does support us already. You know, it yeah. makes a it makes a big difference because uh, doing a podcast turns out very time, labor, money, just intensive all round. You know, Greg joked about it at the beginning, but actually it is now the second most intense thing we've ever done <laughs> so so uh, failing that youtube please um pop along um you know a little click of the subscription is massively helps us and doesn't cost you anything um mm-hmm. and uh yeah we'd be really appreciative of people giving us a follow on youtube if possible and you can find us on uh youtube.com slash at exposed negative and then obviously we're over on instagram at uh, x negative and uh personally at tom com and at greg fennell yeah so i think Excellent. that's i think that's pretty good i mean we should just sign off now because we've done the outro haven't we yeah we've done the whole use of so have you enjoyed listening to this week's episode of the exposed negative podcast well join us next week um but we've got honestly we do have a couple of really great uh episodes coming up um, and the feedback we've had from doing the new format, Fireside, and then an interview, has been has been overly positively, overly positively, has been positively received. So, yeah. But likewise, with everything we do, if you've got any feedback, drop us an email, info at exposednegative.com, um, and it will most likely sit in our inbox for a few days because we're super, super busy. But we will come back to you at some point, I promise. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening. Till next time.